I have here a packet of yeast that I bought from the supermarket this morning. Well, actually, it's a packet of lemsip because I forgot. But um, <laughs> if you imagine it is a packet of yeast, then it would contain 60 billion individual yeast cells. That's 60 billion microscopic living factories, which we can use to produce alcohol for us every year on a scale of billions of litres. Now, around 50 years ago now, we first deciphered the genetic code, which is the basic machine language used to program that factory. And around 15 years after that, the first biotechnology company, Genentech, wrote a simple script to produce human insulin in bacteria. In 1982, that process was approved for commercial production and therefore replaced the existing technology of extracting insulin from animal sources. Since that moment, biotechnology has already had a huge impact on our lives, uh, particularly in the, the healthcare industry. But as we go forwards, uh, biotechnology is now evolving into a more of an engineering discipline, which we call synthetic biology. Synthetic biology is defined as the engineering of life into uh, systems which don't exist in nature. And what distinguishes it from biotechnology is not really what you do, it's how you do it. So it takes on principles uh, from other disciplines, such as the electronic industry, such as standardization of parts. Um, if you're going to build um, electronic components, you can, there's uh, catalogues of well-characterized parts which you can buy and you have a reasonable chance of knowing that they're going to slot together and you can build a device. This has been lacking in biology, but it's now starting to happen. What's really enabled the, this to happen, though, is now um, technological feats. For example, um, synthesis of DNA is far cheaper now than it used to be, and we can produce much larger um, strings of DNA than we used to. So for, for just about £100 now, we can typically synthesise a particular gene which does a chemical reaction and in as little as a week we can receive it in the lab ready to test rather than in the past when we'd have to copy and paste things from, from nature to assemble genetic parts. So now when you actually have the ability to write DNA exactly how you want then you can really start to look to standardise things and you can do make progress in a much faster way. But it's not just individual genes we can now synthesize. In 2010, J. Craig Venter announced the, the synthesis of the first entire bacterial genome, which is around half a million DNA base pairs long. And that's, that's actually quite simple for a bacteria. It's one of the smallest genomes. But this was synthesized in the lab and then reassembled and transplanted into a recipient cell which then rebooted according to the bacterial genome which it was based upon. So now we, we can really rewrite the entire operating system of the, of the cell. The problem now becomes, what do we write? The problem is biology is not really that simple. Um, we still don't even understand much about how it works. So the ideas of standardization are great in principle, but they the biology and the complexity of biology already gets in the way. So going back to the yeast example, the genome of yeast is 12 million base pairs long. And that codes for about 5.7 thousand genes. And we only actually have experimental evidence for what 37% of those do. So in, in that background, how, how can you really use standardization? I mean, it, it's, it's too difficult. What we're doing in our lab is um, using a different approach. So we are trying to use standardized parts, but the way what we're standardizing is the way we characterize those parts. So we can get an idea of how they behave in context with the whole organism under different environmental conditions and different genetic backgrounds. So we get an idea of their robustness and how, whether they'll interact with other factors in the cell as well. And we hope that this will make them much more reproducible. If we add automation to the equation as well, we can do these experiments on, on um, liquid handling robots. The procedures then become a software algorithm rather than a, a written, 
procedure carried out by a, by a human being, which then has to be replicated by another human being in another lab. And this um, inability to reproduce results has been a big stumbling block in the past. But hopefully with automation and the way we standardise our parts, it produces a much more scalable system, which is more robust and a better indication of how these things will perform on large scales. Here's a quote from Jay Keesling, who's a famous synthetic biologist. The carpet, the paint on the walls, the ceiling tiles, we have the potential to produce all of these products from sugar. But I think we can go further than that. The beauty about synthetic biology is that the sheer diversity of nature means there's so many different parts available for us to use as these building blocks. And we can take advantage of the fact that m there's bacteria which grow all, in all sorts of environments. So we, we can actually make these things from whatever feedstock we want, whatever makes sense. So it's feasible we can make perfumes or air fresheners from raw sewage, for example, which would be quite poetic, I think. Um, we can use um, carbon dioxide as well, um, waste carbon dioxide from industrial flue gas. We get organisms which can actually grow just on that and some simple carbon, so some simple uh, salt solution, the nitrogen source. So I think we made a lot of progress over the last 50 years. But the way that the field is going, I think um, synthetic biology is really going to affect almost every industry on the planet. And now it's, it's more accessible um, to non-specialists and to people from other disciplines. I think whether you're an artist or a designer, an engineer, a statistician, whatever you are, I think you can have a, a role to play in this. Thank you.